Good morning. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. We're going old school today, so I'm going to start the services briefly this morning with a couple scriptures. Um, so the Lord wants to tell us this morning, he makes all things new. Amen. He makes all things new. Yes. He makes all things yes. new. Yes. And just in case we aren't convinced, he's going to tell us in the Old Testament, he's going to tell us in the New Testament. He makes all things new. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and mighty warrior. They lie down together and they cannot rise. They are extinguished. They are quenched like a lampwick. Do not earnestly remember the former things, neither consider the old things. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it and know it? And will you not give heed to it? It will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Yes, amen. Let going of what's behind, pressing forward to the mark that is before us. That was from Isaiah chapter 43. And now I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 21. The new Jerusalem. Then I saw a new sky, a new heaven, and a new earth. For the former sky and the former earth had passed away and had vanished, and there no longer existed any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, all arrayed like a bride, beautified and adorned for her husband. Then I heard a mighty voice from the throne, and I perceived its distinct words, saying, See, the abode of God is with men, and he will live and encamp and tent among them, and they shall be his people. And God shall personally be with them and be their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be anguish, sorrow, and mourning, nor grief, nor pain any more. For the old conditions and the former order of things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, See, I make all things new. Also, he said, record this, write it down, for these sayings are faithful, they are accurate, they are incorruptible, and they are trustworthy and true, genuine. And he further said to me, it is done. It is finished. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I myself will give water without price from the fountain, the springs of water of life. He who is victorious shall inherit all things, and I will be God to him, and he shall be my son. So I think the Lord is telling us this morning to let it go. Yes. To let it go and look up and look to him and know that it is finished. And when we see something that isn't redeemed, when we see something that isn't new, that isn't full of life and peace and joy... We speak grace to it, yes. and it becomes a new work in our life. And God does a new thing, and it is finished. Yes. So let's speak to the dead. Let's speak to the pain. Let's speak to the anguish, those things that he has put away. Yes. Grace to it. Yes. Grace to it. Yes. And it is all new in Jesus' yes. name. In Jesus' name. All right. So this morning, any prayer requests? Yes, James. right, James. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Any prayer requests this morning? Anything else you want to take to the Lord this morning? Yeah, Mike. Cindy, uh, yeah. Just keep making us 
Um, so I just, my, my baby just graduated from high school and she will be leaving in, I'll be with you for like half the year, she's older than that. Uh, she's leaving at an hour and a half away to go to her parents' house. So if everyone could just pray for her that she will have wisdom and patience <laughs> and grace, not to deal with college, but to deal with my mother. <laughs> We'll speak grace to it. <laughs> oh, it is hard when our little babies leave the nest. It's great when they come back, and it's great when they go again. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, and I would just ask, um, I know I put something on Facebook. My high school friend I grew up in church with, um, her 10-year-old daughter uh, is getting ready for her second round of chemo. She has Burkitt's, Burkett's leukemia. It's a rare form of leukemia. She's 10. Um, her dad is a chaplain in the Air Force. They're stationed in Alaska right now. Um, her dad was in Afghanistan when she was diagnosed and is back with the family. Now they have 13 children. <laughs> um, and this is the 10-year-old. So they have kids, I think, ranging from 24 to 2. So um, just remember Mariah. Um, she's getting ready to start her second round of chemo. So. Anyone else this morning? Yeah. Wow. Word, Tanner. All right, well, let's stand and go to the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, 
You've spoken the words today, Lord. You are making all things new, Lord. And we speak to these situations, to the bodies, to the health, to the children that are leaving, Lord, to the children that are growing and leaving the nest, Lord. We speak grace to them, Lord. That every situation, Lord, that you have given us, your Holy Spirit in us, an authority to speak and to loose and to bind. And right now we speak grace to it, Lord, and trust that it is finished. And the work that you have done is all that is necessary. We just simply believe and put our hope and our trust in you for the healing and the body that's needed, for the relationships, Lord, for the children, Lord, that are going out on their own, Lord, for the bodies of the, the children, Lord, for sickness and disease to be cast aside, Lord, for illness, for pain and suffering to be gone, Lord, for wisdom, Jesus. And when we speak grace to it, we speak life. We speak newness of life, Lord. We speak peace. Lord, we speak to the mountains and they will be cast into the sea, Lord. We speak to disease and there is health and wholeness and healing, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you guide our paths, Lord, that your word is a lamp unto our feet, Lord, and let your word be what flows from the utter of our mouth, Lord. Wisdom, Lord. Wisdom, Lord. Be with us this morning. Fill this service with your presence, Lord. Rejoice together, Lord, in your presence, Lord. We come to worship. We come to, to feed upon the word of your spirit, Lord, the word of truth. Jesus, have your way in this service. Minister to your people. Give your people boldness to be bring forth the message for this service, Lord. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. All right. Just a reminder, if you brought a cell phone today, please silent it or turn it off. And Friday, June 9th, Eastern Gate House of Prayer this Friday. Focusing on the Lord naturally, or supernaturally, I should say. <laughs> Today is Pentecost Sunday for those who uh, follow that realm. Um, <clears throat> we're just going to seek his face. I know we want the relief on this body, a new thing. He's already starting to open the doors. We've seen the women stop in situation, uh, burst forth. We've seen the other situation starting to burst forth here. So we just seek his face and his strategy and to prepare uh, the continuation of what he's releasing through this year. Mm -hmm. And church picnic, uh, the following uh, next Saturday, 1 o'clock, there is a sign-up sheet in the back foyer for anybody that plans to come. Please at least write down um, maybe a dessert or a side. It doesn't have to be exactly the dish. It's room. I love Head count. Room. So it's at the Hamlins, 1 o'clock next Saturday. Bring a lawn chair. They'll have tables. They'll have a canopy. Oh, a directions, yeah. Yeah, and I've got this uh, cryptic map. Cartography is not my. Uh, <laughs> but it's telling you, it's uh, it's not complicated. You just go up Hubble. Hubble becomes Highway 65. You go through Bond Ramp. You go over Elmo Pass, which is the name of Bond Ramp. You cross the Scud River. As soon as you cross the Scud River, you take the first right. You just follow that road all the way up. Then you jog a little bit. There's a couple stop signs. Um, let's see, uh, John is here today, and Ron, do you want to come take the offering this morning, the two of you? Been missing both of you guys. Good to see you this morning. John, you want to ask the blessing this morning? Lord, we 
Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. If you believe him, reach out for him right now. Hallelujah. He's not far from any of you. He's right there in you if you're a believer. Amen. Whatever you have need of, he's already provided. You just receive it by faith right now. Faith's not a hard thing. You just believe what he said. You just accept that what he said is the truth. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for healing us, Lord. Thank you for delivering us. Thank you for providing for every need in Jesus' name, Lord. You are a great and a mighty God, and there's none like you, Lord. Hallelujah. We praise you this morning. And everybody said, praise the Lord. Amen. Give him a hand. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. And my grandkids can go to Sunday school. The only ones here. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good to see uh, Toby and Jody again. You know they've been busy on the uh, on the uh, professional ball circuit. Praise the Lord, or semi-professional. Praise God. And uh, Darlene and Don. Praise the Lord. Good to see you guys. Amen. All the way back from Phoenix for a little while. Praise the Lord. It's great to have them back part of the church from its inception, amen, and uh, I don't mean the church of God, I mean this church, praise the Lord, hallelujah, and so, amen, God's got some good things going on, praise the Lord, and hope all of you again uh, will be able to make it to the the picnic, Sally's been freaking out about the weather and temperatures, and I said, I don't get it because it's summer, I mean, it's hot in the summer, right? Well, you have picnics. Yeah. Praise the Lord, you can't have them in the snow. Well, I guess you could, but it's just not as much fun. So anyway, come if it's hot, yeah, just get over it. Praise the Lord. That's why we sweat, right? <laughs> Amen. No, but we, we've got some awnings and some things uh, that are going to be set up, so there'll be shade, and we've got a lot of trees. You'll you'll be able to find shelter from the – and if it gets too extreme, you can always – Go in the house, praise the Lord, for a little bit, cool off. Amen? So anyway, we're looking forward to that, the tent. And barring any, you know, just really wild, crazy weather, we're, we're on. So, And if you have any questions about my, uh, about my map, Sally's thinking about framing it. But before she does, there's a few copies back there that if you have any questions, it's not complicated. It's just 4569 Flower Street. And it's out in kind of in the, it's in a housing development, but it's out in the middle of nowhere. So. But it's not hard to find. Just go straight up. Hubble becomes Highway 65, goes through Bondurant, you go over the Lover Pass. As soon as you cross the Skunk River, you turn right. You'll go through two stop signs. The second stop sign, you make just a little jog. I mean, it's just one of these things. You go on into the development there and until you come to Flower Street, which I think is either the second or the third, but I'm never going anywhere but to my house, so I don't count the streets. So it's Flower Street, turn right, which you have to turn right. Go down the bottom of the hill. 4569 it's right on the you know the 911 things out in front of all the houses there it's 4569 pull right in the driveway and that's where we're at praise the Lord so you'll find it without any problems if you don't you can call and Sally will give you better directions praise the Lord so it is Pentecost uh, Sunday and uh, I think it's there's some things I'd like to talk about concerning that because uh, you know we've talked about it before everything Everything in the Old Covenant, all these feasts, they're beautiful expressions of, of uh, God's prophetic uh, way of speaking to us. But ultimately, they're talking about Jesus. And so I want, that's what I really want to bring out today. There's people here that have different needs, and of course, we all have something going on because we're here on this planet, amen, and it's all messed up. And because we're on it, we get to deal with all that messed up stuff. But God has an answer for whatever that need might be. Regardless of how desperate you may be, no matter how much you think that, well, you know, I've thought this before, I've prayed before, I've done this and I've done that. Suzanne said it well this morning. That's history. I don't care what your experience is, this is the truth. And so, you know, you can say all you want to say about, well, you know, I but I had this and I've had that. We've all had stuff. Some of us still got stuff. But the word of God is the final word. And that's where we have to settle the issue. Amen? That's the foundation. Without that foundation, 
everything else crumbles. Amen. No matter how disciplined you are, no, ma no matter how, you know, uh, intellectual you are, no matter how strong you are, it'll all come to nothing eventually if you don't have the foundation of Jesus Christ and confidence in him. Amen. Amen. So we're going to begin with uh, at Leviticus chapter 23. And I want to read uh, verses 15 through 21. Leviticus 23, verses 15 through 21. And I'm glad you're all are here, not just Darlene and Don and Toby and Jody. So if you're feeling shunned or rejected, get over it. Praise the Lord. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenths meal. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. You shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year, and one young bullock, two rams, and they shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord with their meat offering and their drink offerings, even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. Then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering and two lambs of the first year for the sacrifice of the peace offering, and the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord, for the priest, and ye shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be a holy convocation unto you. Ye shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. Praise the Lord. So we know uh, there's this uh, the wave offering. You know, uh, if you've watched any Christian TV, you know you know all about the first fruits offering because they've been after you for that for uh, you know some of them. That's all they ever talk about. Praise the Lord. Well, we'll get into that in a little bit, but praise the Lord. That, that's, that's really not what this is about. I love this, the last uh, verse here, verse 21, where he says that you be a holy con this will be a holy convocation unto you. You will do no work, no laboring, no laboring in the law, no laboring. Just This is a day when you just rest. Praise the Lord. So the, when we go back to the Passover, we talked about this. Uh, a few weeks back, obviously, around Easter time. And, you know, traditionally, if you look at a, a, a Jewish a Hebrew calendar, you'll find that uh, Pentecost, the, the first fruits or the harvest festival, all of these things, they happen always at the end, of, either at the end of May or the very first part of June. You know, depending on when the Passover is, obviously, 50 days. So it's always within a, a week, you know, of, from year to year. And the Passover we know was established by God, and it was established by God for the purpose of teaching us how to find God's peace. Mm -hmm. Say amen. Praise amen. the Lord. Because we find peace with God when we appropriate Jesus as the Passover lamb who died for our sins. Mm -hmm. Now we have peace with God. We've been reconciled to God. There's no more enmity between us and God. God now has received us back into his family. Amen. And we are, amen, one with him again. Amen. And while that is, it's, it's the great blessing, amen, but it's not all that we need, and it's not all that God has for us. God doesn't just want to give us peace. God wants to give you power. Yes. Hallelujah. He wants peace we have to have first, because then we don't, otherwise we wouldn't know how to use the power. But he doesn't want to just give us peace. He wants us to have peace, and then he wants to give us power. Praise the Lord. Yes. Pentecost represents the second major encounter that we can have with God in order to walk in God's rest. Yes. Praise the Lord. Think about it. Peace is great, but without power, it's hard to stay in rest. Because right. the enemy's always coming. There's right. always stuff coming at you. Right. Amen. And it's hard to stay in peace unless you have a sense of power over exactly. the enemy, over the situations and the circumstances that come against us. Amen. Yeah. We have peace. We have peace in Christ because he has given us all power. Hallelujah. Amen. He had all power and he has given us. So therefore go, he says, and work these works. Praise the Lord. Greater works than these shall you do. Hallelujah. Yes. So 
it represents the second major thing. It represents us being able to walk in God's rest. And that's why in verse 21 it says, you will do no servile work on this day. It's the Feast of Pentecost, and there's not going to be any work, and you're going to rest in what God has already done. Amen? Amen. You're going to rest in the power of God Almighty. Because traditionally, in Judaism, God gave the, the Torah to Moses on the day of Pentecost. Yep. What would later be the day of Pentecost, it hadn't been established yet, obviously, because they were just getting the word of God. But the Torah was given on what we call Pentecost, and what is referred to as Pentecost in, in the scripture. So look at, let's look at this, Exodus chapter 19 and verse 1. Exodus 19 and 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they unto the wilderness of Sinai. Now, the third day, in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone out from the land of Egypt, the same day, or the same time, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Now, the, the third day of the third month, if you look, drop down to verse 11, if you would, Sheila, just so you know I'm not taking this out of context, but in verse 11... He be, be ready against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. So we know it's in the third month. And in the third day, amen, which is the, the sixth of, if you're looking at a Hebrew calendar, the sixth of Sivan. And here's what happened. Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 through 20. And I just want to mess with our, you know, normal religious traditions about this because not because it's just something to do but because I think we miss a lot of the subtleties of what God's trying to give us and then we have to work through all kinds of religious thinking to get to what it is God's really saying. Amen. Sometimes we just need to back away from that and take a clear, clean, new look at what God is saying because he wants us to understand this. He wants us to operate in this and the church has been very anemic in all honesty in terms of the power of God. Now we've we've you know we've majored on the on the peace of God, and in some areas we've talked about the power, but it's been more about my power and not God's power, and you know follow me and so on and so forth. But here he says it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. I want to go down through 20. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke. That was not a smoke break. They were all together smoking, praise the Lord. I mean, it was, the mountain was smoking. So because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. I can't help myself. But, uh, you know, John Cougar, that song. That's when a smoke was a smoke. Yeah. Praise the Lord. That's what I'm talking about. That was smoke. That was the smoke of God. Amen. So therefore, I just, you know, I just, one of those things. Because the Lord descended upon it. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And then the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder. And Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And I want you to notice something. This is really not so much geography as it is opportunity. Okay, so keep that in mind as we, as we go along here. So because as these words are used over and over in different ways, and then we, they get translated to fit whatever our particular denomination or our creed or doctrine might be instead of going to the original root word to see what it is God's really trying to say to us. Amen? So here, this, the, that's the English translation. Jewish tradition says that they actually saw the voice of God. Praise the Lord. In heaven, you know, when you, when you think about these things, you can hear colors. Yeah. You can see sounds. Mm -hmm. so it's a whole different realm. We're not talking about the five senses we're dealing with here. You've got a spiritual sense that can tune in to everything in a way that you cannot do here. Right. So this is what was happening. This was a, an encounter 
with God, and they actually saw the voice of God coming out of the mountain in tongues of fire. Come on. And they heard the one voice of God in the mixed multitude that came out of Egypt. This is who's there at the mountain, right? And they all heard this one voice, saw this one voice in their different languages. Praise the Lord. And since it's weird, obviously, to see languages or to see voices, it's translated thunderings and lightnings. Mm. That's, the, that's what the Jewish teaching is. Wow. So it sounded like thunder, and it appeared like fire. But it was just a voice. So they're trying to make sense out of seeing something that isn't normally seen. It's just heard. Amen? But this is the voice of God. One voice heard by everybody in their own language. All right, look at, look at this in Psalms chapter 29 and verse 7. Praise the Lord. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. And we think about this as all, you know, Book of Acts stuff. No, this is just God. This is just, this is just a revelation of the glory of God. It's just people seeing something of God. Amen? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 and 19. Hebrews 12, 18 and 19. See, God does want to do a new thing, but it's not a new thing to God. It's only new to us because we're, we're dense. I'm not pointing my finger at you. I'm... I'm I'm using the inclusive phrase here we're to make you feel better, praise the Lord. But I'm just saying, we're looking at stuff from a religious perspective, even when we don't know that we're looking at it from a religious perspective, because God wants to be something new. God wants us to see him uniquely as he is, praise the Lord, because then it becomes personal to you. Because you've got people that are struggling with real issues, and it's because all they really have is somebody else's interpretation of God. They don't have an encounter themselves. And that makes it very difficult to believe that God loves you, that God has provided for you, that God wants to do all things for you. Amen. You need to have a relationship with God. You need to have something more, amen, than just a religious teaching about God. Praise the Lord. So, for you are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words which voice they that heard entreated that they would not or should not be spoken to them anymore. They were freaking out by it. Amen. It was too scary for them because it was something unbelievable. Yeah. They're seeing a voice. Right. Amen. Yeah. And they don't know how to process this. I mean, this is just way too much. Remember now, these people don't have the Holy Spirit. The Spirit would move on them. So they're, they're flesh. They're just strictly flesh. They can't get past their natural way of thinking. They, and the problem is with the, much of the church, even though we have the Holy Spirit, we're still operating in the flesh. We're still having problems getting past our intellect into what God really wants to have us experience and be a part of. Amen. So God came down the mountain, Mount Sinai, and he came to meet with his people. And they saw voices of fire. Now, it was an awesome revelation, amen, of the glory of God. And yet, because of their sin, it says about 3,000 died. Mm -hmm. Well, that would mess up your yeah. desires for relationship in a hurry, wouldn't it? Uh -huh. Praise the Lord. But that's, that's what happened. Because they were sinners, and they were saying, we will do whatever you tell us to do. We can do whatever you want us to do. And then they didn't. Yeah. They put themselves in a position where God had no choice but to operate within the covenant that they had asked for. Amen. Amen. So about 3,000 it says. Look at Exodus uh, 32 verse 28. Sheila. Exodus 32 and verse 28. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. Now see, the, the first Pentecost didn't happen in the book of Acts. It happened in the book of Exodus. The first Pentecost, God wrote his words, his, his moral law, but he put his words on tablets of stone. Now look at Jeremiah, 
chapter 31 and verses 31 through 34. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Now they've got a, this is Jeremiah now, so they've got the, the covenant, the Mosaic law. You've got to keep the laws. You've got all the sacrifice. You've got all the stuff you've got to do, right? So I, the day's coming. The day that he gave that law, it, the covenant, the original covenant, the, the, the law, it was written in stone. Moses went up, Right? opportunity to be with God and God gave him so behold the days come and say the Lord that I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt which my covenant they broke although I was a husband unto them saith the Lord but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days saith the Lord I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Praise the Lord. That's, believe me, that's a better covenant. Hallelujah. In fact, Hebrews even says that it is a better covenant. Paul talks about it over and over. So here we got... For 1,500 years, every year, for 1,500 years, people are coming to Jerusalem hoping that God's going to fulfill his promise to write the law in their heart, to put his word in them instead of on them in, in, in restrictive ways. But he would fulfill his promise to write his law in their hearts, and they went home disappointed. Every year for 1,500 years, thinking this will be the year he keeps the promise of this new covenant. Now, again, I will go back to where we were, but Pentecost was also referred to as the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of the Harvest. First fruits. All right, look at Exodus, or yeah, Exodus 23 and verse 16. We'll just look at a couple places here so we can see. Exodus 23, 16. Feast of harvest and the feast of harvest of first fruits of the of thy labors which thou hast sown in the field and the feast of ingatherings which is in the end of the year when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field gathered in what you worked for right numbers chapter 28 and verse 26 Also in the day of first fruits, when you bring a new meat offering unto the Lord after your weeks be out, ye shall have a holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work. She's trying to establish a, another way of thinking, you know, within the parameters of what they've already got. You, you gather up the, the, the thing you've worked for, and he's saying, but I've got a better plan. There's going to be a first fruits offering. There's going to be all this, and, and you're not going to do any work. The stuff all fits, to, it all works together. Amen. It's all part, he's pointing to a new covenant, to a new thing. Amen. And so Jesus fulfilled Pentecost. Yes, he did. When he was glorified and he was exalted to the throne of God, he was seated at the right hand of God. His, he's at rest. He said, it is finished. And what did he say? You are seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Our work is done. This, this stuff of thinking you got a bunch of stuff you got to do to get power is just bogus. It's not, it's not true. You have the power if you are in Christ. And you can rest in that reality. Praise God. So rest in the finished work is what he's saying. So then he sends his Holy Spirit after he ascends up into heaven. Amen. He sends the Holy Spirit to all believers who have believed in the Passover that he has given us peace with God. So he sends back the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And what was it? The word of God in our heart. Yes. Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
He's not writing it on tablets of stone. He actually places it in us. Now, we, now, you can debate about where is that. I don't know, and it really doesn't matter to me because this is just external stuff anyway. It's somewhere where it matters. Right. Praise the Lord. But I will say this. I've been in a situation. I bet everybody in here can say like, amen to this. But have you ever been in a situation where, you know, you felt impressed to say a certain thing to a person? They're, they got a problem. They're talking to you about it, and they're sharing stuff with you. And you, but you don't have a scripture. You know what I mean? You don't have a, a, a chapter and verse that you can give them, but you feel led to say a certain thing. And then, you, lo and behold, you find out that's actually Bible. It may not have been verbatim, but it was the principle that the Bible was trying to establish. Why? Because you have the word in you. You may not have the King James Version, but you have the truth of God in the innermost part of your mind. Hallelujah. The deepest part of the recesses of who you are and what you are, that God can quicken that and draw that out of you. Because you have, if you've got Christ in you, you've got all the word that there is. You've got more word than there is in the Bible. Right. Praise God. So that's what he's talking about. On the day of Pentecost, you... He sent his spirit, the spirit of Christ, the word of God, and he wrote it in your heart. Thank you, Lord. Instead of on tables of stone. And now he says, rest in the finished work. Praise God. That was the spiritual reality that God had promised through the prophets. Look at John 12. Verses 23 and 24. For 1,500 years, Jews had been coming back, waiting for this. They didn't know how it was supposed to happen. Right? right? Obviously they didn't, or they would have accepted Christ. Yep. They wanted the promise. They just wasn't sure what the promise really meant, right. how it could work. Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Yeah. First fruits. Yeah. The fruit offering. That is what he's saying. I'm going to die so that this feast can become a reality. Right. Not just some symbol, not just some thing you do once a year, right. but a reality in your life. Yes, Lord. The first fruits are going to come. Him, the first fruits, and we are the fruits that follow. Praise the Lord. So, 50 days to Pentecost, the first fruits, and exactly 50 days from Jesus' resurrection to the day that he sent the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. All right, John chapter 20, <clears throat> verses 19 through 22. We're spending a lot of time trying to get God to do something that he's already done. That we're supposed to be declaring and doing the works and greater works than these. And we're still begging God to do something. And he doesn't even know what we're talking about when it comes to that. Praise the Lord. So then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. They said, uh, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, they didn't receive the Holy Ghost then. He's just giving them a taste of what's coming, right? Well, yeah. Praise the Lord. So Jesus had more for them, and that more for them was to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Come on. All right, look at Acts chapter 1 now, verses 4 through 8. Being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, 
which saith he, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked him of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be witnesses unto me, in both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. That doesn't mean you're going to be a witness in the sense of, I mean, it, it, it means this, but this not, not this alone, that you're just going to be standing on a corner somewhere handing out tracts saying, Jesus loves you. It's true, and there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not really the emphasis of what he's talking about. He says, you're going to do stuff that I won't, I'm the only one that's ever done. And people are going to know, just like he said to them, don't believe me for what I'm telling you, believe what I'm doing. If you can't believe me just because of the word's sake, then believe me for the very works. Praise the Lord. And that's what God's trying to get across to us. Amen? Amen. To receive power. Hallelujah. And you'll go to the other most parts of the earth, all right? Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Acts 2 now, verses 1 through 8. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Praise the Lord. random. I just think faster than I talk. <laughs> so there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it set upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues and the Spirit gave them utterance. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because they, that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. So we have this idea or this image that they were all in this house in an upper room somewhere, which they were at one time. But they were all in one mind and one accord. And I'm saying they were at the temple. Because otherwise, why are all these thousands of people hanging around their house? Right. All these people are there for the Feast of Pentecost. Right. They're there for the temple. They're there for the offerings and so on and so forth that are taking place at the temple. Come on. So these guys are at the temple because why? Because they've made an association that the thing that Jesus told them about receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit was the same thing that God had prophesied. 1,500 years earlier, that I'm going to write my word in your heart, yeah. amen, and, and you'll no longer need somebody else, rabbis, everybody else trying to teach you, but you will know God, uh, every man, come on. Yes. Come on. and you're going to have power because of this. Yes, Lord. So, now remember, God had given the Torah on this very same day, uh, hundreds of years earlier. But the Torah alone could not provide them with power. In fact, the Torah by itself condemned them. Right. Kept them su subject to their own weaknesses. Yes. Amen? Yep. It wasn't the promise of the Father. Jesus, the Word of God, made flesh, crucified, rose again, and sends back His Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Word, mm -hmm. the Lord. Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So you need the word, but you also need the spirit. Yes. Anybody ever take a theology course or look, you know, read anything by theologians? They got the word, man. Yeah. They can give you all kinds of words. Problem is, most of them don't have the spirit, so they don't even understand what it is that they're talking about. Exactly. They're just talking the theology. They're just talking theory. They're just talking, you know, historic events. But they don't really have any confidence or faith in it because they do not have the Spirit of God. Come on. That's where these people were. Right. They had the Word, but they had no power. Come on. All right? 
Instead of rushing to the foot of Mount Sinai, they rushed to the foot of Mount Zion. There you go. The temple. Yep. Praise the Lord. Yep. They rushed to the temple. And as they approached, they heard the disciples worshiping God in different languages. And just as their ancestors had heard this thing at Mount Sinai, they saw and they heard tongues of fire. Lord. They saw the voice of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 15. Here's the thing that makes you wonder. Look, they said, they were all gathered. They were in an upper room. Wait a minute. There was 120 of them there. Didn't they, isn't that what it says? I can go back to the scripture and show you, but for the sake of time, there was 120 of them there. That was the number of the people that were there. Right. You can't get 120 people in my house, right. let alone in an upstairs room. Right. I mean, anybody here can get 120 people in your house? Nope. I mean, you might if it's like the old days of how many can you get in the Volkswagen or how many can you get in a phone booth. Yeah. But you're just... You're not doing anything. You're, you're, that's, that was, see, the upper room is what he was talking about clear back in Exodus. They were in a position of opportunity. They were all in agreement with what God wanted to do. And we've made it all about geography or get this or get that or be in a certain place and it's going to happen. No, it's be open to what it is God's wanting to do and God will do it. Amen. He doesn't care if you're in an upper room or a basement or a bathroom or, a, you know, your car. Come on. Praise the Lord. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day. The third hour of the day is like 9 o'clock in the morning. That's when they start the sacrificial offering. Right. That's why they were there at the temple. Exactly. Praise the Lord. Uh, drop down, if you will, Sheila, to verse 37 through 42. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what do we do? Well, Peter said, This Jesus that you crucified 50 days ago has risen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Then Peter said unto them, They said, What are we supposed to do? And he said, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's important. The promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words he did testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized the same day. There were added unto them about 3,000. The same amount that died yep. under the law, under the being written on tablets of stone. Lord. Now in their hearts, and 3,000 were born. So, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking the bread. Now, a couple of things here. One is, he says that uh, to all that are afar off. And again, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit was taking place on the very day that the Jews were offering the two wave loaves to God, mm -hmm. showing their dependence on God and, uh, and their thankfulness for his providing for their daily bread, meeting their needs, in other words, whatever their needs might have been. Now, remember the two waves, they were baked with leaven, which means sin. Leaven is a type of sin. Right. One loaf was pointing to the Jews. They were still sinners, but although they were sinners, they had received the power of God by acknowledging Jesus as Messiah and Lord. These are Jews that are receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Lord. These are Jews that God is keep is pro, the promise of his new covenant to this same people, to these Jews. Yes, That's who's at the temple. It's not Gentiles. It's not right. Greeks and all these other people. These are Jewish people, regardless of whatever their their family background, I mean, what country they come from or wherever they come from, Mead, Parth, you know, all these different countries. They're all Jews or they wouldn't be there. Right. They're there for the sacrifices. They're there for the Feast of Pentecost. Uh -huh. And God gave them 
the fulfillment of that covenant promise from 1,500 years before. Finally, after all of these years, these people that responded, they said, what do we do then? Change your mind about God. Be baptized. This is, you know, the mitzvah. This is what had gone on for hundreds and hundreds of years to just cleanse yourself. It, it's, it's symbolic that I'm not that person I used to be. Right. Amen. I'm still a Jew. I didn't, I didn't become something else, but I'm a believer in Christ. Yes. I've seen the face of God. I've seen the Savior come. Yes. Praise the Lord. So they're sinners, but they've received the power of God. By acknowledging Jesus as Messiah, as Lord. The fine flour. Remember, the loaves are baked with leaven, but the, the flour is ground so fine, there's no coarseness left in it. That's Jesus. Now about the other loaf. Look at Acts 2.39, back up to Acts 2.39. Well, we know the one loaf was for Israel. The fine ground flour is Christ. The second loaf, for the promises unto you, your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Yes, Lord. Wasn't long after this, Cornelius. Peter's up on the roof of a house, supposedly. He's in a position of opportunity somewhere, and God speaks to him and opens up this big net filled with all kinds of unclean animals, all kinds of non-kosher food, right. and he says, eat. Yeah. Peter said, whoa, no way, Lord. I've never touched anything that's unclean in my life. I've never eaten anything but kosher. God said, don't call, don't t don't call dirty what I've called cleansed. Yes. Gentiles were dogs. They, they were the filthiest thing. They were uh, you couldn't interact with them. That's why it was so weird when Jesus did respond to a Gentile here right. and there. Because right. it was not his time yet. Right? Wasn't, God wasn't ready for that. He was trying to come to the house of Israel first. Right. Well, he kept his word. Yes, he, did. he came to the house of Israel first with his promised covenant. Yes. And they, some responded and some didn't. Right. But they're, at the time that all this is happening, they're doing this wave offering yep. with something they didn't even understand what the wave offering was about. Exactly. I mean, they knew it was dependence on God, but they didn't understand the fact that this was not just for the Jews, but it was for the Gentiles. Yes, it was for whosoever will. Lord. Praise the Lord. Fine flour, two loaves of leaven. Fine flour is Jesus. Righteousness, without sin, perfect, no coarseness about him. And the two loaves are the Jews and the Gentiles. Yes, Lord. Both have sin in their lives, but both can receive the power of God yeah. because of trust in Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Not that we don't still make mistakes. That's a nice way of saying not that we don't still sin. But our sin is covered. Thank you, Lord. And even though we have sin, we have power with God yes. because Lord. of Jesus. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We have a covenant with God that says, I put my word in your heart. It's no longer on tables of stone that you have to work and work and work to try to keep it. It's now Christ in you. Praise the Lord. Acts 2, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Yes, Lord. First Pentecost, about 3,000 died. Second Pentecost, or this Pentecost that we're speaking of here, about 3,000 were born of the Spirit, yes. given life, Thank you, Lord. eternal life. The Spirit is poured out in the upper room. I want to. I just want to show you a couple things because I think some of you may be thinking, well, this is kind of a stretch. But look, the upper room, look at Luke chapter, uh, well, you know, in Luke chapter 22, you don't have to go there, Sheila, for the sake of time. But he talks about Jesus before his crucifixion. He told his disciples, he said, go out and you'll find a, a donkey that's tied up here. And he says, and go to this guy and tell him you have a, a, an upper room and we'd like to use it. The master has need of it. Right. It's a furnished. In fact, this, in, in Luke 22, it says a furnished upper room. Yes. That room, that word room, is 
topos. Topos. And it means a space. Amen? So, you know, a part of a building or something. So that's, that's genuine. But then in Acts, where it talks about room, it says they were all in this upper room when the Holy Spirit fell. It's a different word altogether. It is chora, C-H-O-R-A, and it means condition or opportunity. Mm -hmm. So they weren't in a, you know, it wasn't like a confined area or in a, you know, geographic space of some kind. They were in a condition of opportunity. They were all together in this condition, and it gave opportunity then for God to do what God had promised 1,500 years before. They believed when he went up the mountain. He put himself in a position where opportunity met demand. And God did what only God could do. So the church is born, but this isn't just about the church being born. This is about God keeping covenant. Now, I'm saying all this for this reason. For 1,500 years, Jews kept coming, kept coming, kept coming, expecting this will be the year, this will be the year. Not even knowing for sure what it was they were expecting, except that God was going to keep his covenant. And he's faithful to do it. So I'm saying, why is it that we don't have total confidence in the power that God poured out to each of us? Praise the Lord. At some point, somewhere, at some time, you were in a condition of opportunity. And you said, Lord, I believe. And not only did you get born again, you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he gives you evidence by speaking in other tongues. And if you haven't spoken in other tongues, all you've got to do is do it because the gift is free. It isn't complicated. You don't need a big thing going on. You just need to yield and do it. You say, well, it sounds ridiculous. Well, you know what? A voice that I can see is far more ridiculous than anything you're ever going to say. Uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. It isn't, it isn't what, what it sounds like. Right. It's what it represents. Yeah. Right. It's the voice of God. Glory. In fact, the Bible says when you pray in tongues, it's the Spirit or it's God praying to himself. Yeah. Yeah. Lord. Now, how I many know God knows what you have need of? Yeah. You may think you do, and you're crying and moaning and groaning and Lord. complaining and begging and pleading and everything else, and God's saying, just let me do it. Lord. Just let me have it. Praise the Lord. And you'll receive power. Amen. Praise God. So if you still want to argue the point of where they are, where they were, where they might be, the moment you received Christ, you became the temple of of the living God. You were put in a position of opportunity in a condition of opportunity. Praise the Lord. He said he was going to come to the temple. He's still coming to the temple today. Everybody's worried about when they're going to rebuild the temple. I don't know and I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. This is the temple that he comes to. Yeah. You are the temple of God. That may fulfill some future prophetic thing or something. I don't know. But that's not what's important. What's important is he's coming to this temple. Come on. He's already acknowledged it as his temple. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right, back to Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34 again, Sheila. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. You see, if you think outside the box, and let me say it this way. God was in a box for a long, long time in the Ark of the Covenant. And because of that, 
That was where he confined himself simply for the sake of the Jews to have his presence because they didn't have the spirit of God. But if you think about it, we're still doing that. And so many other religious things that we do, we still got God in the box. If you're, if you're afraid to think outside the box, if you're afraid to think of God as doing something new, it won't be new to God, it, but it may be new to you. Praise the Lord. Then you're not much better off than having that physical temple with a box in it that you really don't have access to because you're not good enough. But God tore down the curtain, made you the temple so that he can dwell within you. So that you can have power. You don't have to carry the box around for power. Uh, well, that's what Israel did. They always sent the ark out in front because it, it was the power of God. Right. You are the power of God. Yes. You have received power. Yes. You are the ark of God. You are the temple of God. Yes. And we got to grow up and start thinking outside the box if we're ever going to get what God has promised us because he's not going to do anything else. We, we're waiting. We're always pointing down the road to something God's going to do somewhere, somehow, some one day. If everything aligns, we get every all the stars in alignment. You know, if we get all of our acts together and we all come together and we all pray long enough and fast long enough, God's look. That, I'm not saying don't pray. I'm not saying don't come together. I'm not saying don't fast. I'm saying it doesn't make God do anything. He's already done it. It might wake you up to what he's done. It might cause you to realize you already have power. You just need to step out and begin to declare it. You just need to start walking, amen, like who you are. You need to start thinking yourself as the ark. Man, devils scramble when the ark come around. I can't tell you all the crap that happened to people. Some of it's just really not good. I mean, everything from... From instantaneous death to hemorrhoids. Yep, exactly. Now I've never experienced death. <laughs> but praise the Lord. There's stuff that's painful. It's just not comfortable. Praise the Lord. So I'm just saying. We, we, we need to be a pain in the butt to some people. Yeah. The enemy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We, need to, we need to drive him off. Yeah. Okay. Hallelujah. And instead of that, we're, you know, we're waiting. Behold, the day comes, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. Now, I, I'm saying this for two reasons. I was teaching Wednesday night on a similar subject, but not in any kind of depth like this. It was just kind of what we're supposed to be doing, what I feel like God's telling us we're supposed to be doing. So, and I mentioned, I said, I, look, I, I don't believe in replacement theology. And anybody right. that does isn't reading the Bible. Right. This was to the Jews first. Exactly. Amen. Whether they respond, how they respond, it's no different than Gentiles. Right? right? I mean, it, you, you still have to believe. You still got to respond to the word. You still have to respond to the invitation. Right. So this isn't replaced with theology. God's still got a covenant with Israel. He's got a remnant. He's got some people that are, that are believers yes. that go all the way back to the book of Acts. Because these first believers were Jews. Right. Yeah. Come on. All the disciples were Jews. Yeah. Right. Jesus was a Jew. Yeah. But God expanded the parameters of this gift. Yeah. He said it's not just for Israel and Judah, but it's for whosoever will. It's for yes, Lord. those that are far off. It's right. for anybody that will believe. Yes. Yes. So he's not replacing Israel with the church. The believers that are Israeli are as much the church as we are. Yes, they are. Amen? Amen? And those that aren't, he talks about in Hebrews, Paul talks about it. He said, you know, if 
There's no other sacrifice. If you reject this sacrifice, there is no sacrifice for sin. So I don't, no matter what they do, they got to come to Jesus. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Exactly. You, you, we're all freaking out about building the temple over there and all that. Maybe they will. I don't know. I, I, I'm not, I don't focus on that. But I'm saying it won't matter because the truth is that may create a big issue yeah. at the time. But the ultimate answer is still they still got to come to Jesus. Yes. No matter how many, how many sacrifices, we already got it in the word of God. There is no other sacrifice. If you reject that one, you can kill animals from now till, till Jesus comes and it's not going to change anything. He is the sacrifice. He was the sacrifice. He's the totality of it. Amen. But Jesus is the word of God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, here's the deal. The church began in a blaze of glory. Yeah. I mean, voices that you can see. Yeah. 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 Fire, hallelujah, that you can hear. Yeah. And then, around 312 A.D., the church becomes an institution. Yeah. And it's been struggling with that ever since, to some degree or another. Let me, there's a couple more things here, and we'll quit by noon. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And a lot of the reason why what happened from 312 on, the church became an institution, and what happened was the Holy Spirit had no more authority, or only the authority that the church leaders would allow. I mean, you know, there's lots of churches that don't believe in the infilling of the Holy Spirit. They don't believe speaking in tongues. They don't believe in divine healing. They don't believe in anything. They don't, they don't believe in anything other than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. There's never been a Pentecost for that. Praise the Lord. And there's others who claim that they're led of the Spirit when they're just as carnal as dirt. Right. So it's, it's a challenge. But we have to take risks. Amen. If you're afraid to think outside the box, if you're afraid to try to let God have opportunity in your condition, then you're just stuck with whatever you've always had. It's nothing's going to change. So it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. Now you need to get the, the language here because it's just what we're talking about. Yeah, that's right. that's right. In the last days, he says, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God. And he'll teach us his ways, which is exactly what he says in Jeremiah. Yeah. Walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Mm. All right, now look at Acts chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. They weren't in a split level. <laughs> they weren't in a house. They were at the temple. Yeah, there it is. Yes. Praise God. Uh -huh. And I already talked about it. I won't go into it. But the whole idea of 120 people in a in a house, especially the houses that they lived in then, it's impossible. He's not talking about somebody's home. He's talking about the house of God. First Kings chapter three and verse one. First Kings three and one. Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. That's the word house of the Lord that's used in Acts. Mm. My father's house, Jesus said, is a house of prayer. Yeah. Yeah. You are the temple of God mm. and the spirit comes 
to the temple. Praise the Lord. Because of Jesus, we are the righteousness of God. And we're to go in the power of his spirit. And Jesus said, the things that I do, you're going to do. And greater works than these will you do. Because I go to my father, the spirit's coming back to the temple. And he'll say, the spirit of the Lord is upon you. Because you're anointed to preach the gospel of grace to the poor. To heal the brokenhearted. To bring deliverance to captives. To bring sight to the blind. And to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Today's the day. Every day is Pentecost. Today is the day that God fulfills his promise of empowering you. And giving you all authority. You're in Christ, and don't let it bother you. Don't let it freak you out. But he said, all power is mine. Heaven, earth, beneath the earth. Yes. Go ye therefore. He has restored us to God. Yes. God's power is now my power. Yes. I'm not usurping anything from God. I'm just saying this is what he said. Yes. So today is the day of salvation, which means every day yes. is the day of yes. salvation. Why? Because God is his his promises, his mercies are new every day. Why? Because God never ages. Every day is today. Every, every moment of, of forever is today with God. God doesn't live in yesterday or tomorrow. He lives today. Every minute is today for God. And should be for us. Nothing shall be withheld from you. If he so loved you that he gave you the first fruits, Jesus, how shall he not by him give you everything? Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. That's what the Spirit has brought. Everything. Every promise of God in him is yea, and in him, amen. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Just say, I got the power. Got the power. Amen. You just need to let it go. Hallelujah. You need to just release it. Praise the Lord. He, he gave it to you so that you can give it away. He has blessed you. Now, we got a, we got a covenant that goes all the way back to Abraham. And he has blessed us to be a blessing. He has empowered us to empower others. He has graced us so that we can grace others. He has loved us. So we can release the love of God to everybody and to anybody who will. Yeah. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Pentecost. Every day is Pentecost. Yeah. Amen. Every day is a good day with Jesus. Amen. God bless all of you. Amen. Pray for one another. Trust the Lord. Believe God for a miracle. Amen. And then believe him for a bigger one. Hallelujah. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.